There's one other place that Jesus needed to be ministered to with an angel. With an angel. And it was in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was right before he was going to the cross, it says that he sweat like drops of blood. And he was so in, it was so intense and he was so sorrowful, even to the point of death, that it, it crushed in on him. And it was so bad that that temptation in the garden to not go to the cross. He didn't want to go. He prayed, Lord, no, Father, not my will, but yours. If there's any other way, if there's any other way, you take this cup from me. And it was so intense. It was so intense that it says an angel ministered to him even there. And so he's tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. Today in 2013 in the real world, outside of, outside of this archaic book that some call it, what does it matter about Jesus' temptation? What does it, how do you apply that to us today? What difference does it make? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 14. You're going to learn some good stuff today. I hope you're ready. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. I hope you take notes today. If you don't normally take notes, please. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then, I'll wait till I hear pages stop right now. When you're there, look at it. Chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let's stop right there. We have a great high priest. Not just a high priest. We have a great high priest. And what makes him so great is obviously the sacrifice that he made. You see the high priest made uh, sacrifices for himself and the people. He would go in and make sacrifices before he would go in for the people. And then he would make sacrifices of different variations for the sins of the, the people. But Jesus is the great high priest because he was not only a high priest, but he was the sacrifice. Right? He was the supreme sacrifice. Look at chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was hurt because of his godly fear. Now let me read that verse 7 again. I believe that is talking about him in the garden. Think about Jesus in the garden. And this is talking about that, that, that onslaught and what he went through. Verse 7 again. Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was hurt because of his godly fear. Verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He suffered during that temptation. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. See, Jesus went through temptation. See, you do know that Jesus was fully God and fully man, right? He was 100% God and 100% man. We can't, we can't wrap our minds around that, but he was fully God he was fully man. And as a man, he was tempted to sin. And he learned something. Do you know that God learned? God, doesn't know, God didn't know everything? What? Let me explain that as we go. See, God coming in the flesh... But James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God, for God cannot be what? God can't be tempted. And if God can't be tempted, he doesn't know what it's like to be tempted. Until he took on flesh and blood. This is why it's so important that Jesus was tempted when he was, because he... Uh, I'm going to jump this. God came in the flesh... To be tempted, well, he was tempted in the flesh so that he would can identify with you and me. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse fifteen. Well, let's leave verse fifteen. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let me read that again. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted so he could sympathize with us. See, before he didn't know what it was like to be tempted. Now he does, and he can sympathize with us because he identifies with us. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like for you and me to be tempted. That's going to come in really nicely in here in a moment when we finish reading this passage. He was tempted in all points as we were. And that, that phrase, as we were, means in every aspect. How can you be tempted? Somebody just, let's just throw some things out here. How can, how can you be tempted? What things can you be tempted with? Now, if you, if you mention it, it doesn't mean that you're tempted with it. Okay, just throw it out there. Alcohol. Okay, alcohol. What else? Oh, what do we mean? Food. What? Food. Pornography. Parents. Uh, Drugs. Uh, there's so many things out there. Uh, you know, cheating on a spouse, lying, or whatever. There's so many different areas out there. Stealing. <laughs> deceiving. Just uh, half-truths. Okay? Now, Christ can sympathize with <laughs> us on that. Look at verse... Chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews 2, 18. Not only can he sympathize with us, but chapter 2, verse 18 says, For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to what? What? To aid or to help those who are tempted. See, 1 Corinthians, I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 10. You can write this down. 10, 13 says, you've probably heard this before. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that, beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the, the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, he aids us out of that temptation. He makes a way for us to get out of that temptation. Because he was tempted, he sympathizes with us, he identifies with us, and he gives us a way out. He aids us to get out. There's three sources of temptation. James tells us pretty clearly it's our flesh is one. And that's usually the big Because we have a sin nature, right? And of course, when we come to Christ, we are, you, we, his spirit comes to, to live in us, but our old sin nature doesn't leave, does it? That's because we have this desire, we have this lust of the flesh that we want to do, we want to sin, we want to get into temptation. And a lot of times that it's our it's it's us. The second one is Satan. Satan would tempt us. Use things to tempt us. And then there's the world. Well, you can't flip the TV channel or like I've said before, probably last week, I think it was, I can't I can't you almost want to put your hand over your kids' eyes when you walk by the, the magazine stands, just the covers. This is what I'm talking about, the real world. How do we live in the real world? You have all this, these things that, that bombard us. Temptation is like this. It's like a, it's like this bait. It's like this bait for a fish. You throw that out there in the water and you wait, and, then, and the fish are just like, oh, I've got to have that. I want that really, really bad. And they, they just... They just really, really want it. And some will, some will fall for it. Some won't. And if they don't, you have to change the bait, right? And Satan does that to us sometimes. Here, you want a bite? Right, you want a bite? You don't want that, do you? How about this? How about we, how about we change the bait? I'll, I'll put a dollar on here. How about that? How many of you would be attracted by the dollar if I put that on here? You come up here and you want to take that. <laughs> yeah, you would. How about a hundred dollars? Oh yeah, that's right. We put that on there. How about we put that on there? How many of you might want to walk up here then? Raise your hand. That's a little bit. Yeah. You gotta just back off, right? What What I found though is this: is in my daily life, temptations are more like this. You know what I'm talking about? Is that you? They just bombard us. I mean, from every direction, everywhere you turn, there's this, there's this, there's this. All this stuff flying at you. We just are attacked all the time in the world that we live in. So what difference does it make? 
tempted so that you and I, or so that he could sympathize with us and aid us in that. He knows what it's like. He, when, when he was on this earth in flesh and blood, he wept over Lazarus' death. He knows what it was like. He knows what it's like. He knew what it was like beforehand. But, but in this, he had never been tempted before. Because God can't be tempted until he took on flesh and blood. Let me give you some quick facts about temptation. One is it's common. Expect it. If you don't expect to be tempted, you're in big trouble. You're probably going to be one of the first to fall. Take heed lest you, you know, you think you stand, take heed lest you fall because it's coming. Temptation is coming. Especially when you set out to, I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to follow him wherever he goes. If he leads this way, I'm going. You better know temptation's coming. If Jesus is going this way and you're going this way, you don't need to tempt him. He's already got you. You're, you're already, see, that's part of the, 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 the thing is the Satan's purpose is to draw you away from the Father. And if you're not, if you're not following Jesus, draw you away from him, then he, you know, who cares? Another myth is this, temptation is a sin. Temptation isn't sin. If so, then Jesus would have been guilty of sinning, right? It's, it's when we leap into sin. Now, some of you have heard people say, well, I just kind of fell into sin. You ever hear that? You don't just fall into sin. It's, it's usually kind of a process. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a moment when we make a deliberate choice to go against the Word of God. <clears throat> we make a deliberate choice. I'm going to step over the line. I know it's wrong, but I've made that choice. Now, how do we fight temptation? One is, like Jesus did in Matthew and Luke, with the Word. When, he, when Satan, the, the recorded three temptations that Jesus faced, every time Jesus said, it is written, he used the Word. That's why I say this all the time. This is the most important thing that you'll ever have. Read it. Digest it. Meditate on it. Get it in your mind, your heart. Live it out. Be ready ahead of time. <laughs> the, the second thing is this. How do we fight in the real world? Is it focus on the big picture. The problem is, when we, before we leap into that sin, we don't stop and think because we're not thinking. Think about the big picture. Before you take that step across or that leap across, think about how is this going to affect my health? How is it going to affect my finances, my relationships, God's plan for my life, and my witness? How is this going to affect people around me? I think if people would stop and think about those for a while, we would take a step back before we cross the road. Another thing is, remember, God provides a way out. We just talked about it. And also remember this. We've been given, we've been told to be filled with the Spirit. And He gives us the power and the strength we need. It's available to us if we will just allow God to lead us. He gives us that power and that strength to resist. And so many people, we just let our flesh go. The Spirit is willing. Flesh is weak. See, we need to also identify areas where we're weak. Somebody mentioned food. If you have a problem with food, I ain't got a problem with food. You, know, you, don't. you don't have a problem at all. I know. I've seen you eat. If you have a problem with 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 gluttony, let's just let's just call it what it is. If you have a problem with gluttony, you might not want to go to the all you eat buffet, right? If you're tempted to cheat on your spouse, you might want to stay out of places that like the bars and things like that, and places that's yeah, open up right to, right. to <laughs> lend themselves to something like that. If you have a spending problem, you might not want to go to the mall just to look. Remember this, if you remember nothing else, HALT, H-A-L-T, I came across this. This is, this is a pretty good thing to remember. To keep from falling, or not falling, jumping into sin from temptation, is remember those four words as an acrostic. H-A-L-T. Do not allow yourself to get too hungry, too angry, too lonely, or too tired. Those four things, if you allow yourself to get too much of, it's going to drag you down. 
You get too hungry in any area of your life, not just physically, spiritually. You let yourself get hungry. Jesus said, while he was being tempted, man does not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do not let yourself get too hungry in any area. Do not let yourself get too angry. There's nothing wrong with being angry. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin in your anger, right? Don't let yourself get too angry. Don't let yourself get too lonely. When we find ourselves getting too lonely, that's when we start, you know, straying from our marriage. Don't let yourself get too tired. When you're, when you, when you're exhausted, what do you tend to do? You tend to slip a little bit. You're not, you're not you're on your A game. You, you need your rest. So remember, halt. Listen, another thing is this. When you sin, when you do take that step, when you sin, take responsibility. Everybody should say amen on that. Amen! Take responsibility. I get so tired of somebody saying, well, it's because of this and this and they did this and I think of Adam and Eve in the garden, you know how it is. It's, it's never changed. Never changed the creation. Adam and Eve needed the forbidden fruit. They're hiding from God. God's coming through in the cool of the day. Adam, where are you? They're hiding. He, he discovers something's wrong. He says, well, what'd you do? And what did Adam say? Lord, it's my fault. Messed up. So what he said? No. No, he didn't. He said, that woman. That woman. <laughs> it hasn't changed, has it? <laughs> and I love, I love what Adam says next. He has the gall to say, that woman that you gave me. <laughs> What's he saying? He not only blamed the woman, he blamed who? God. God. I was fine. When I was by myself, I was fine until you gave me her. It was her fault. <laughs> that woman that you gave me. Wow, really? <laughs> but it hasn't changed, has it? When we fall, when we jump into sin, I keep using that phrase because we use it all the time. When we jump into sin, when we walk into sin, deliberately, we blame everybody else but us. Sometimes even God. Well, if, if this hadn't happened to me, if you'd have, well, if you know. Next thing is, it's a band will come. Who did get a double A plus today, by the way. I don't know if we've ever gotten a double A plus. Another thing before you walk into sin and temptation, remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for that sin. See, Jesus not only learned what temptation was, but he also learned something else that God did not know before. And that was the weight of sin. When he was on the cross, he bore the weight of of the sin of the world. And he had never experienced that before because God is sinless. Jesus was sinless. Don't, don't leave here and say that I said Jesus had sinned. That's not what Scripture says. It says he became sin for us. He knew no sin. He did not become sin, but he had the weight of the sin of the world on him. And he had never known that before until he took on flesh and blood. See, Jesus learned what it felt like to be separated from the Father. He identified. That's why he can identify with us. Think of that the next time before you fall into jump into sin. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter four and verse fourteen. I want to look at these two verses going into it because here is the awesome news of this whole thing. Chapter four, four verse fourteen. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So because Jesus was tempted, he can sympathize with us. He aids us in that temptation. And because of that, because of his temptation, look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time. The path overwhelms me. That's a verse that we read all the time, right? Let us boldly come before the throne of grace. We can only do that because he was tempted. We can only do that because he sympathizes with us and he can identify with us and he knows what it's like. So we can boldly come before his throne because he's like, I've been there. I've been tempted by it. Everything that you've all been tempted by. Only come to me because I, I have what you need to make it through that. And even when you fail, it says he's faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sin. So that's why we can boldly come in there. And boldly, boldly simply, simply doesn't mean you go up there with arrogance, but it means you go up with assurance and hope and humility. See, Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, what I want you to leave here is, the last thing I want you to leave with is this. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. And it shouldn't make us want to sin. It should make us want to sin no more. So when we go only come before his stone of grace, it isn't like haphazardly all messed up. It comes to, you come before him boldly because he said, I've been there. I've wept. I've been tempted overwhelmingly. I don't think we can, I don't think we can fully understand how he used it. As much as we've been bombarded. We never know. He says, come. That's why Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you peace. Maybe you've never accepted Christ's gift of salvation. You start exactly where he did. You believe. Peter said, "How?" They asked him, "How must we be saved?" He said, "Believe, repent, be baptized." I'd ask you to come this morning. You've never made that decision. Maybe you just need this Monday to read a prayer with you. I didn't get a count.